Hey guys, welcome to another episode of NetSec Now. Today we're going to get into discussing exploitation, the third phase of the phases of network security and penetration testing. So let's start off with a disclaimer. Any information disclosed in this series is provided for the sole purpose of learning network security. We take no responsibility for any misuse of any information we provide. We only suggest you audit the systems you have permission on or otherwise in your lab. Moving forward. So the phases of penetration testing, right? We went through it. The first phase was information gathering, doing your homework. Uh, we made a video on that, so if you haven't seen that, go ahead and uh, check that out first. Uh, the second video we made was the recon stage, building a case. And of course, again, if you, if you haven't seen these videos, guys, go on the, the uh, YouTube channel and check them out. Uh, today we're going to be discussing, as I said, the access and exploitation bombs away phase. Uh, some of the things we're going to be using we'll get into here in just a minute. So let's talk about the types of different attacks for exploitation. There's a remote attack, a client side attack, a blind side attack, social engineering attack, a fuzzing and, and denial of service attack, and man in the middle attacks. So you might be asking yourself why so many different attacks. Well, I'm going to explain just the top three here because that's what we're going to actually be getting into today. Actually, we'll be getting into the top two, but I'm going to explain the blind side attack as well. So the remote attack is basically you're trying to exploit uh, services that are vulnerable that are remote services, something like um, you know NetBIOS or DNS or you know something to that effect. A client side attack, on the other hand, is something that you're trying to exploit client side wise, a vulnerability in Java, Flash, things like that, and that kind of ties into the social engineering attack with like the social engineering toolkit, which we will be making a whole separate video on as well. So. Um, the blind side attack is an attack that I don't generally recommend using unless you are absolutely at the end of your rope and you are desperate to try to get in or you just want to make sure that you've covered all bases, right? So a blind side attack is basically firing everything in your toolkit at your target and hoping for something to allow you in, okay? Um, blind side attacks are very, very noisy. Blind side attacks... Um, you know, can cause system damage, uh, you know, downtime or, you know, server system crashes, things like that. So I don't generally recommend that unless it's a last ditch effort to try to get in uh, to your client's network. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, talk about some of the tools that we're going to be using in this episode. Uh, we're going to be using Metasploit and Armitage, Armitage being the front end uh, GUI version for Metasploit. Now, Armitage is very limited in some aspects. Um, I've actually recently, uh, if you've been following us on Facebook, I posted on that. I uh, found a bug inside of uh, Armitage uh, when you're using PS exec and pass the hash attacks. It actually will work, but it doesn't show the target system as being compromised inside of Armitage. However, if you emulate and do the exact same thing in MSF console, which is the command line version of working with Metasploit, uh, you will actually see that it does in fact open a second interpreter session and uh, you know it does work. So we're going to be learning um, also MSF console because it's really good to have the core fundamental understanding of how Metasploit actually works. And again if you run into bugs with Armitage or something you're just not sure is working correctly you can always go back to MSF console and then you could do it in there and see if in fact it does or does not work. The uh, old school manual compile and fire, basically, we're not going to get into that today. Uh, I try to stay away from that. Um, that's mostly if you find private exploits that haven't been made public yet. Um, you know, really, you got to trust the person you're downloading the script from, and then you have to compile it. So if you can't read the code of whatever they, whatever language they wrote it in, you're kind of taking a crapshoot on whether or not it's actually bad for your system as well. Uh, as maybe utilizing some sort of attack for the remote system. Uh, remote system. So, social engineering toolkit. We're going to actually make a video separately based upon just the social engineering toolkit, or otherwise known as SET, inside Kali Linux. Cobalt Strike. Um, you know, that's that's like it's made by the same guy, Ralphie El Mudge, that made uh, made Armitage, but. Uh, it's a paid version. It is quite expensive. We went over that in the past. Uh, so we're really actually not going to be getting into that or using that, even though I believe there's a 14-day free trial on this website. Um, you know, we're not going to get into using that. So denial of service attacks, guys, you're probably never going to use that against your clients uh, when you're doing this professionally. Uh, there is rare occasions where you might find a vulnerability where it, it 
uh, requires you to fuzz or denial of service attack one service or part of a service to get around whatever protections in place and gain the actual access or information you're looking for, uh, albeit very rare, very rare. Uh, Google finding vulnerability feed sites. There's sites like Security Focus and uh, NS, NSIT, NIST.gov, uh, things like that. So we actually have one on our website, learnnetsec.com, uh, on the front page there on the bottom right. So uh, also there's various other tools, uh, miscellaneous tools in Cali that you might be using. Um, you know, really it depends on what type of audit you're doing. Each client is going to be different. It's never going to be a set standard of hey, well, this works every time, so I'm going to use this every time, um, you know, and talking about exploits and things like that. So uh, there's miscellaneous tools for information gathering, stuff like that, which we've went over in the other videos. So we're going to fire up our Kali Linux box here. Okay, so in the last video, we showed you uh, how to use OpenVos, NBT Scan, um, you know, and some other tools uh, inside there. Today we're going to be using Metasploit and Armitage and then we're going to be doing uh, MSF Console if I can fit that into this video. If not, I will make a separate video just based upon MSF Console. It is pretty intense to get used to the syntax of commands and how they work, so uh, that might be in a separate video. It depends on how long this one runs. So we'll start off with Metasploit and Armitage because that's the easiest to gather. Okay, so the first thing is first. Um, our network has changed a little bit since the last uh, video. Uh, IP addresses may have changed, things like that. So uh, you want to go ahead and do an NBT uh, scan again. You want to do an NMAP scan again. Uh, and then I'll show you how to import uh, your NMAP scans and stuff like that inside of uh, Armitage. So I've already went ahead and done the NMAP scans uh, and the NBT scans to find out what the live hosts were. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and actually fire up Armitage right now. So you go to the Applications menu. Go to the Kali Linux submenu and then down towards System Services, go to Metasploit and then Community Pro Start. Now, if you haven't already, you have to register for the free serial key for the community version. Just go ahead and do that. Uh, we have actually mentioned that in the video of setting up Metasploit and Armitage. Uh, please go back and reference that video and check it out. So the reason why we do it this way is it's a little bit easier than, you know, starting a bunch of services. As you can see here, it starts three services in particular. All right, so the next step is just to enter in the command Armitage and hit enter. So that's going to start the, the Armitage front end. The first dialog box you're going to be presented with is actually the login box to get to the database, to connect to the database, the PostgreSQL database. And that should come up here in just a second. There we go. So just go ahead and click connect. Everything should be fine there in terms of username and password. It's going to ask if you want to start the RPC server. Go ahead and click yes. And don't worry about this uh, connecting to localhost 55553 uh, connection refuse connection refuse. It's actually just trying to establish its connection. It may take a minute, maybe 30 seconds, uh, but eventually it will start Armitage as a service. And Armitage, I believe, is written in Java, so, you know, with Java, uh, you know that there is some lag inside the application itself. And there we go, it says connecting to database, and it's going to go ahead and start Armitage as a front end. So I'm probably going to have to clear out our database here, because I was doing some testing when I found the bug inside Armitage, so I just uh, want to start fresh with you guys, so I'll go ahead and do that here in just a second as soon as it comes up. Uh, to clear a database at any time, guys, just go to the host menu at the very top here and just go down to clear database. And I'll show you how to do that in MSF console as well. And just click yes. Okay. So basically, um, we want to start fresh with importing our NMAP scan. And I'll show you how to do that. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can actually import host into Armitage, and I'll show you how. At the very top here, click hosts. Now you can go to import host, which is what you would do if you were importing something from like Nmap or, or you know some other scan you did. You can go to add hosts, which pops up a box and you can add one host per line. I don't really recommend that unless you're scanning just one particular IP address, but uh, I don't actually ever use that. Uh, the other option you can do here is uh, an Nmap scan. Now Metasploit itself has an Nmap module built into it, right? Um, I prefer to do my NMAP scan separate because if, if I need to do a specialized type of scan, at least I can specify that in the command line parameter flags. Um, 
but in here you could actually choose um, intense scan, intense scan plus UDP, intense scan all TCP ports. It can be quite a bit slower when you do an armitage, so be aware of that. So if you want to go ahead and just do an intense scan, it's going to ask you to enter in your IP address or range. So if you had one single IP address, if you were doing a remote audit, you would go ahead and just enter in the uh, WAN address of your client. Uh, if you were doing an internal audit here, of course, you can go ahead and enter in uh, your IP address range, uh, 192.168.1.0 slash 24, and you can enter that in here. I'm actually going to cancel out of this. If you also notice that sometimes when you open up dialog boxes, there is no cancel or you know close button on some of them. Just right click on it and go to close. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and import our Nmap scan. All right, guys, so as I said, let's uh, go ahead and import our scan here. So in order to do that, you have to go up to hosts, import hosts. Now, if you remember in the last video, uh, we tried to keep an organizational structure going and we put our, all of our clients' information, scans, etc., into uh, their own folder, right? So if we remember correctly, that was in Acme Inc. So just simply go to navigate in there. And my fresh scan that I did since the network has uh, changed has been fresh-scan.xml. So just go ahead and highlight that and click open. And you can see here on the bottom uh, that there's a console, and then each task that you do opens up another tab. So in, in fact, this one is called import because we're importing. Now, if you notice, it'll tell you that it successfully imported the freshscan.xml. Okay? Now, you can see here, it, it kind of looks cluttered because everything's stacked on top of each other, right? So, we just go to Auto Layout, right-click in the uh, empty space here, go to Auto Layout, click None then go to layout and uh, just click stack that's the one I like best alright so let's pick apart some of the information that's imported here so obviously I did a uh, range scan or a CIDR scan in Nmap as we did in the last video so dot one dot one I know is the router so in order to make things a little bit simpler to understand I'm gonna go ahead and right click on this one and just go to host and remove host because I don't want to waste time scanning things that I, I don't you know want to scan so once that happens here, now again, like I said, Armitage is a little bit slow. Okay, so 1.3, uh, I believe, is my machine here. And let's just double check that. Yeah, 1.3 is this machine here, and I have no interest in scanning my host machine that I'm doing these videos off of, so I'm just going to go ahead and remove this one here as well. Okay, so now we have three hosts, all right? And if you highlight over each one of them and just run your mouse over, it's going to tell you what it is. So 1.2 says it's Microsoft Windows 7. And if you highlight over this one here, it says Microsoft Windows 2000. Well, I know there's not a 2000 box up on there. So then you highlight over this one, it says Microsoft Windows XP. But that's pretty vague, right? It didn't really give us too much information. I want to know what service packs are in there. I want to know, you know, all that good stuff. And while Nmap will generally tell us that, the import feature in Armitage seems not to transfer all that information over, okay? So in order to do that, I want to do all three hosts at once. And there's another scan in Armitage called MSF scan. Now, this is part of the auxiliary part of the scanners, which we will explore a little bit in MSF console. So you go to host here and then MSF scans. It's going to do a more detailed um, host base analysis of what the machine actually is. Now you could also go to Nmap scan and quick scan OS detect, but that may or may not uh, work correctly. So in order to do that, you just left click anywhere and drag the imaginary box here, the highlighted blue box, over all three hosts. Sometimes all three hosts do not have the green uh, box around them. So just try to do it again. There we go. So now all three hosts are selected, and I want to go to Hosts, MSF Scans, and you can see it automatically populates the IP addresses that I'm looking to scan. And I'm just going to click OK. Now this can take a few minutes, guys, because it's scanning all these different ports for services that are running on them, so on and so forth. It's going to try to guess the operating system more directly and try to make a better accurate uh, determination of the operating system. Again, you can achieve these same results in Nmap, but uh, if you're going to use Armitage, which I, I don't really use it very often, but if you're going to use it, uh, it does help to have as much detailed information in it as possible. So you can see here now it's running through our auxiliary scanners, and this is uh, down here um, what you'll see in MSF console when you go to set and use different things. Now you can see that the one that said Windows 2000 has actually changed, and it says Microsoft Windows XP Service Pack 3. 
Now you can see that this one here, if you highlight over it, says Windows Microsoft Windows 2003 Service Pack 0. But that one was reporting as XP before, and this one was reporting as Windows 2000, right? So now we got a clear picture of what we're actually working with here. Now I know 1.9 is statically set for that uh, Windows 2003 standard ser edition server in our VM box, our Proxmox uh, virtual machine host server. Okay, so this Windows.71 or Windows 7.1 has not changed, so that's good. All right, so now we got our host in here. We know exactly what we're looking at. Uh, if at any time you want to right-click on any one of these and go to services to see what services are going, you can go ahead and do that. So you can see here on 1.9 we got DNS running on port 53 and it'll try to do a banner grab, a rudimentary banner grab and tell you what's running on it. We have port 80 open on there as well, Microsoft IISS uh, 6.0. Um, port 88 is Kerberos security or server time. Um, port 135 is Windows RPC. Then we look at 139, well that's NetBIOS, um, LDAP is running on it, SMB which is 445. Now when you're doing an audit and if you're like early in the network and you know we'll get into that in post exploitation and uh, in our advanced series as well. But uh, port 445 is a dangerous port to have open unfortunately there's not too much you can do about that uh, when you're local on a network. Okay. Um, there's a lot of exploits that work on that port for these older versions of Windows like 2003 Server, Windows XP, and even sometimes Windows 7. So then you have uh, K-Password, um, uh, Windows RPC over HTTP, and then TCP wrapped. Okay. So if you wanted to find out what services are running on this Windows XP machine, same thing, right click on it, go to services, and you can see this one's really just running 139.445, so it's just NetBIOS stuff. Okay, Windows 7, same thing. Now, if you notice, every time you do a task, it opens up another tab down here. Now, this can get really confusing and really annoying when you have, you know, maybe 20 tabs open or something like that. So, if you find the information you're looking for as you're going through, you know, you can un uncheck or, or delete, um, you know, some of these tabs by just clicking the X up here. So, we know we imported our stuff already. We don't need that anymore. And we know we did our scan already, so we don't need that tab anymore. So now we just have our services open for each of the three boxes. So now you might be asking yourself, well, that's all great, but you know, when are we going to get into the exploitation? Well, here's where we come into it. So if you remember correctly, we did a in the last video um, in the recon stage, uh, we did the OpenVAS scan, OpenVAS scan, whatever you call it. Um, now, if you remember looking in that PDF, there were some ports open and some services and some warnings and things like that. So the, you use that as a reference guide to try to build your case against what exploit you want to fire at what machine. Now, keep in mind, um, the way that Metasploit works and the way that Armitage works is that, um, you know, it, it kind of goes by what port is open and what service is running on that port. So while we may have port 445 open over here, uh, on on the server, uh, it may be patched already against that vulnerability, right? So you have to keep that in mind that if an exploit doesn't work right away, it may be patched. They may have done their Windows updates, but you know, a majority of the time, they don't do system-wide updates across the whole entire network, or you know, maybe they're um, doing the updates, but a machine failed, and they have no idea that the machine failed to do the update for whatever reason. So you can find a vulnerable target. Now again, um, you don't want to just go off and blindly fire everything. Now when I was talking about the blindside attack, uh, in terms of using Armitage to do something like that, you have to go to attacks and then Hail Mary. And, and what that means is basically it's going to fire everything in the exploit database at that target system. Okay, It's very noisy, it can cause systems to crash, and you definitely don't want to do that to your client. right? Okay, so the first things first. You want to find attacks on a machine. So you want to find what's vulnerable. right? So if you just highlighted one machine here and you just go to attacks, find attacks, it's going to go ahead and query all the exploits in the database according to the services and ports that are running here. And it's going to try to determine maybe what exploit could be you know, used for that port and that service. Now you can see here when it says attack analysis complete, you will now see an attack menu attached to each host in the target's uh, window. So click OK. So if you right click now on the host, you can go to attack and it's going to list a bunch of different things. So there's an MSO3026DCOM, 
Uh, HTTP, this is a bug inside Armitage that I've let Raphael know about in the past. It still hasn't been fixed yet for whatever reason. Um, you can't have something like if you went to, let's say, let's go to DCERPC uh, exploit. There's some exploits that support a check function, and what it does is it doesn't actually fire the exploit against the target. What it does is it, check to, it checks the target to see if it's vulnerable to that specific exploit um, it, it, at, in hand. And then this menu only has one. But if you went down to IIS, you can see that it has three or four of them, right? Four of them. So if you hit check exploits on this, it's going to run each exploit itself and try to use the check function. Now you'll see some of them here say this exploit does not support check. So some exploits that were built and verified and put into uh, Metasploit do not support a check function. So unfortunately on some of those you're going to have to manually fire them and just see. Um, but we're looking for stuff that says you know this target is vulnerable or this target is, is, is exploitable. So you can see on this one here, the IIS MSO307 NTDLL web, WebDAV uh, module, it did do the check, and it says the target is not exploitable. So we know that right off the top there, the MSO3, uh, if we went to attack and then IIS, so the MSO307 we're not going to use, right? We know that right off the bat. Then this one here, IIS MSADC, says the target is not exploitable. So again, if we went to attack and then IIS, and then down here, we know that it's not vulnerable to that one. So there are ones that said, like I said, um, exploit does not support check. Well, the IIS WebDave upload.as or underscore ASP. So let's go ahead and try to fire that one, right? So attack IIS and then the IIS WebDave, if that's the correct one, yes. So let's go ahead and click that to fire this exploit. Now, this is actually going to really push the exploit towards the target and see. Okay, so once uh, you do that, it opens up a dialog box here and it gives you some options. Now, not every exploit gives you these options. Some have options automatically picked for you by default. You are free to change whatever you'd like. So, targets automatic. I usually leave that on automatic. Um, sometimes it has other options here, which we will see later on, uh, where you can choose a specific operating system or service to target. This one's automatic. I try to leave it on that if it has that because it will run through it automatically and try it. Now, in order to, what, using a reverse connection, what that means basically is that uh, whatever uh, payload it's going to use to send to the target once the exploit is passed, and then it comes back to us to pick up the payload, um, we can try to use a reverse connection like a reverse TCP, reverse DNS, or a bind TCP, bind DNS, th things like that. And we will get into that uh, when we're using MSF console. I will show you the differences. You also have an option here is called Show Advanced Options, and if you check that, now our Options menu has changed. Before we get into changing any options, let's go ahead and take a look at the very top here. If you, if you read this, it says this module can be used. It just gives you a brief overview of what this exploit is actually about. This module can be used to execute a payload on IIS servers that have the world writable directories. Um, the payload is uploaded as an ASP script using a WebDAV put request. Okay, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. L host is your local host, which is your machine that you're you're attacking from, right? So I know that this is the IP address of my Kali Linux box, and I can simply go ahead and find that out here by just issu issuing the ifconfig command, right? So this is our IP address. So we know that that's correct. Let's minimize this. Okay, so L port, you can leave this or you can change it. If you want to change any of these options under the value or the right hand tab here, um, you can do that. Okay, let me just close this out here and restart this. Again, Armitage is a little bit buggy, so sometimes you have to kind of do things twice. Okay, so um, the L port you can see has changed. If we wanted to change this, you right you left click on it once to highlight it in blue and then on the right hand panel here you left click it again sometimes you have to do it two or three times until you have a cursor in the box as you can see so if i want to change this to you know dot one or 25721 i could but i'm just going to leave it at the default you could change the path if you wanted to i don't recommend doing that uh, proxies now you could use proxy chains to do this however Inside Armitage, it is a little bit buggy to use proxies. 
when we get into MSF console I will show you how to set global proxies to use proxy chains and proxy chains is something we've discussed over a couple of videos uh, and so you know applying that to using uh, Metasploit with that you can actually set up like an SSH pivot or a pivot through machines things like that uh, you can use proxies to attack from so on and so forth our host obviously is remote host and that's the target machine that we're after and of course that was automatically selected because that's the machine that we're targeting our port is 80 you can leave this unless IIS is running on another port like 8080 or something like that you would change it in here again doing that vhost you don't have to really worry about vhost um, on most of these and show advanced options again uh, you can change the domain name now we should have known that uh, you know if you did like an MBT scan or something like that or even an nmap scan it's gonna tell you what domain it's actually running on alright so um, if we wanted to do that you could alright but uh, you should have this uh, knowledge at hand first and you know before anything so I'm actually gonna change this option here workstation and I'm gonna name this to the domain that it's working on so it's acme inc dot local Okay, so there's other different options you can change in here. I really don't generally change most of this stuff. I kind of just leave it uh, the way it is, unless, of course, we're using proxies. But again, I don't really use professionally armitage very much. Um, so I'm going to always want to try for a reverse connection, right? Because I don't really want to try a bind attack. I want to try a reverse connection. So let's go ahead and check that and click launch. As you can see here, it opens up another tab, an exploit tab, and it says, exploit running as background job, started reverse handler on the IP address of our machine here, okay, uploading the bytes to uh, whatever text file it's creating here, upload failed, 403 forbidden. So that means that it doesn't have the, it's not really vulnerable because it doesn't have the post option as we saw in the description of the actual exploit. It doesn't have post enabled on that uh, on that specific service okay so that exploit pretty much failed okay so the other thing you could do if you notice that uh, you have a vulnerability that's been known to work on this specific service pack uh, so on and so forth that um, you know you're pretty confident it's gonna work um, like an MS 08067 for instance you can always search for that in this box now let's say you went to open Voss and you did your scan and you were like hey it's vulnerable to MS 08067 but uh, instead of going through the attack menu here and trying to find each one of those, um, you know, MS 0867, uh, you know, so on and so forth, you can actually always search for it in here, uh, MS 08, and it'll bring up anything that starts with MS 08, right? So you can see that MS 08067 is down here, there's an MS 08078, so on and so forth, right? And this is all browser based stuff, and you can see the directory tree is auxiliary, exploit and uh, that's pretty much it that comes up in MS08 but if you erase this you can see that there's four directories in here auxiliary which is going to be most of your scanners fuzzers things like that uh, and brute force attackers exploits going to be where all your exploits are actually loaded into and your payload directory is going to be where all your payloads are into so if you expanded this in the payload directory you can see that it has a bunch of different subdirectories in there as well so if we were working with um, this Windows machine here, we can go through here. We can use there's a add user payload. Uh, the interpreter is the really popular one that most people use, and you can see in here if we just move this menu over a little bit, there is a bunch of different things in here. Bind IP version six TCP, bind no NX TCP, bind TCP, uh, reverse TCP, reverse HTTPS. I mean, there's there's a bunch of different stuff in here, right? Reverse TCP DNS, all that good stuff. All right, so those are all your interpreter sub uh, shells in here, and these are all of your uh, Windows payloads as well. Okay, so if we went into the post directory, again, you can go under Windows, and you can go under the various. Now, post is for like post exploitation, which we are going to get into that in the next video. So um, again, let's not get too ahead of ourselves here. Let's go ahead and say that uh, MS 08067 under attack and if we went to SMB MS 08067 well let's go ahead and uh, check all the exploits here because we want to know which ones are actually going to work which ones aren't so we're not guessing and wasting time let's go ahead and do that oh here we go 
So we can see, and we'll just wait here for the results to come by because the screen scrolls pretty fast. And again, some of them don't support check guys, so you're really going to have to just manually fire that one off at them. Okay, so let's scroll up here. The very first one it tried was MS08067 Net API. Very common, very popular in the Windows XP, Windows 2000, Windows 2003 server world. Okay, um, there was patches for it in various service packs. Uh, Microsoft Windows XP was vulnerable all the way up to service pack 3 and an additional couple of updates that actually patched that. So anytime it says a target is vulnerable, well, we know that we can fire that exploit against the target in confidence that it's more than likely 9 out of 10 times going to work. Okay, now there is some false negatives and positives that, uh, you know, are reported back like with any other tool. So we scrolling down here, uh, we notice the rest of them don't support check, but we know that one's vulnerable. Well, let's go ahead and actually fire that one off. So we'll right click on it, go to attack, and then, and the menus are kind of a little finicky when you when you're putting your mouse on it uh, so sometimes you have to do it twice so go back down to SMB and you can see that it says um, and we'll be getting through this in the MSF console part of this uh, use Windows SMB MS08067 now that's what you would do in MS MSF console right click go to attack again uh, SMB and then choose MS08067 net API because we know that that one according to the check option is vulnerable Let's go ahead and click on that. So let's just read briefly what the actual description of this exploit is. It says this module exploits a parsing flaw in the path canonicalization code of netapi32.dll. Well, sometimes in these descriptions it'll tell us what the targets are that are actually vulnerable. So reading down here a little bit, the correct target must be used to prevent the uh, server service along with a dozen others in the same process from crashing. Windows XP targets seem to handle multiple successful exploitation events, but 2003 targets will often crash or hang on subsequent attempts. So you, you pretty much on Windows 2003 server, you only get one shot at this, right? So you have to make a count. Uh, if, if for something, some reason you set something wrong, something gets messed up, that's what, it might crash, and then when you try to run the exploit again, it might not be vulnerable to it, okay? So it might crash that service. So it's just giving you a heads up to, you know, watch out for that. This is just the first version of the module, full support for NX bypass on 2003, with all other platforms still in development. Okay. So, again, L host is us. Uh, L port would just leave that. R host is fine. The R port is fine. And again, you can see now when we click on targets, now we have a bunch of different uh, types of targets in here. We're just going to leave this on automatic targeting. And I want to do a reverse connection because it is available. So I'm going to go ahead and click launch. And here you can see that it's actually exploiting. And it's giving it your fingerprint. And here we go. When it starts to say sending stage down here in the, in the console menu, you know that you're pretty much going to get that box, okay? And then it says, Meterpreter Session 1, Open 4, and it gives you the, the options. Now, you have a Meterpreter Shell command line here, and we're going to get into that in MSF console as well. The beautiful thing about Armitage is it gives you the graphical user bells and whistles interface to say, hey, look, this target's compromised. Okay, so you can see that once the target's compromised, the, the monitor um, picture up here turns red, it has lightning bolts through it, and all that good stuff. So now the information underneath that says we're running uh, this exploit, you know, completed and it's running as system. So we're like God on that machine right now. And since that's a domain controller, that's horrible news for them, but great news for us, right? Uh, so we basically just took down their main, you know, server and now we have uh, system level access to that, which is great because now we don't have to escalate privileges and, you know, go through all that nonsense. So... Right clicking on here, you now see a new option inside of the menu, and it's Meterpreter 1. And if you opened a second, uh, you know, exploit on this, it would be Meterpreter 2, Meterpreter 3, so on and so forth. Now, this we'll get into in post exploitation, but just to give you a brief overview, because I feel it's important to have that before we, you know, precursor into the next video. Uh, if you go through the sub menu here of Meterpreter 1, you have access. You can migrate your process. We don't have to because we're system already, but if you wanted to, you could. You migrate it uh, automatically by default to notepad.exe. So if Mr. Sysadmin is looking in on that uh, specific computer for whatever reason, the server uh, in this case, he's not going to see that, you know, uh, while we're firing commands and doing tasks on that machine that, uh, you know, the system service is 
hammered to death, right? And it's not maxing out the CPU. So if we were doing it on Notepad, that's less suspicious, like, oh, well, the Notepad process just got stuck. And he's probably not going to kill it. Um, anyway, so scrolling through here, you've got escalate privileges. Now, again, we're already system, so we're not going to, you know, escalate our privileges at all. You have steal tokens, dump hashes, which we will be getting into. Uh, this will dump all of the usernames and password hashes for the Windows Domain Controller. And since we're on the Windows Domain Controller, this is really, really bad for them, but really, really good for us, right? Because once we do that, we have two options. We can try to crack the, uh, you know, the hashes, and we'll get into that. We would be using Hashcat and uh, John the Ripper and all that good stuff. Um, we could try to crack the hashes, or we can use a, another attack called pass the hash with PS exec. Now the bug that I found in Armitage, and I'm still trying to, I'm going to make an actual video for Raphael so he understands what the heck I'm talking about, because I posted it on Facebook and uh, he doesn't really, he's saying that it works, but we all know that it's not. I mean, it, it's pretty obvious. Anyway. Uh, so you have two methods of doing that, the LSAS method and the registry method. Either one you choose is going to work just fine. Uh, so in doing uh, past sessions, you have interact, so you can have a command shell on there, the interpreter shell, which we already have down here uh, towards the bottom. Um, you can do, let's see, desktop VNC. It's going to open up a VNC server so you can actually look at our desktop and what they're doing. Um, however, I don't recommend that usually because it will lag their machine a little bit. They might know something's up. Anyway, uh, explore. You can browse the files, show the processes, log keystrokes, screenshot, webcam shot, and there's post modules. Uh, pivoting. We will get into that in the post exploitation. Basically, pivoting means that you now take that one compromised host and you are running all of your additional attacks to the other hosts on the network through that compromised host. So essentially you're furthering yourself away from being detected because everything if they had like uh, host based intrusion detection systems or host based firewalls and stuff like that uh, they're more than likely gonna say hey it's cool because you're part of our local subnet we're not banning you from doing anything right so that's the reason behind pivoting okay uh, you have an ARP scan which you would use probably to find out all the other live hosts on the network if you haven't already now this works great when you're doing a remote pen test and you find a server that's like you know I don't know out on the network has an open port uh, for a web server or email server you wind up compromising that but you want to know how many more machines are behind that network you can go ahead and do an ARP scan and it will go ahead and try to find all the other available IP addresses and you also have the kill uh, option here, the kill menu here, which basically kills your interpreter session. Each time you compromise a host uh, and you take uh, screenshots or you know video of it or proof somehow or some other way, uh, it, it's always advised to kill the session after you are done because somebody could hijack your interpreter session, uh, being the bad guy could hijack your interpreter session and uh, cause havoc for your customers. So always kill your sessions as you're backing out. One machine at a time, kill your sessions. Okay, so anyway, uh, now you have services again and scan again and host again and all that good stuff. Now, we don't need to attack this one any further, right? Because we've already got this host compromised. We're in, that's it. End of story, game over for this host. So now 1.4, um, this one here is our Windows XP Service Pack 3. Well, gee, let's try to go to attack and let's go over to SMB because that's always such a fancy one to uh, attack that service there. Uh, and you can see MS08067 is listed again, MS10061 spool SS is listed again. And then we have a pass to hash option, which again, if we had the hashes already from the Windows server, we would right click on this one here and go to pass to hash. And then of course, in Armitage, like I said, there's a bug and it will, it will succeed, but it won't show the host is compromised up here in the GUI screen. Anyway, so let's go to um, this SMB and let's go ahead and go check all these exploits. So you can see it's checking MS08067 and while MS08067 said that Windows XP up to Service Pack 3 is vulnerable, again as I said in the beginning, it could be patched. So it's just going off the port and the service that's running on that port. It's not checking legitimately uh, whether it is patched or not. Uh, in this case, uh, on the MS0867, I'm sorry, it is checking that uh, if it's patched or not, and it's saying the target is not vulnerable. I know that that machine automatically did some updates before I shut them off, so I know that it was vulnerable at one time, but the updates took care of that vulnerability. 
right? So again, you may come into a mixed network where you find some targets, uh, you know, their updates may have failed, or maybe the sysadmin is just not doing updates on that specific machine for whatever reason. There might be an update that conflicted with uh, one of their uh, level of uh, business apps that are running on there or something like that. So there are some times where you're going to find that uh, sysadmin intentionally does not do updates on one machine. And Nine out of ten times, guys, or maybe eight out of ten times, guys, to be honest with you, it's on Windows servers, domain controllers for some reason. Uh, they don't want to update it because they're afraid that uh, it may break the OS, which Windows updates, let's face it, have been known to do for ages, uh, will break the system. And if it breaks their server, guess what? Their whole network is down, right? So they don't want to break that. So they're just not doing updates on that server. Bad news again for them. Good news for us. Okay. So as you can see here, it went through all of its checks. And there was quite a few here that didn't support check. Uh, MS 10061 spool SS did not support check. So let's go ahead and, because we know MS 08067, which we used to compromise the Windows 2003 server here, is not exploitable on this target machine here. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to fire off the MS 10 one. We'll right click on it again, go to attack, SMB, MS 10061. Okay. So let's go ahead and leave all of this, all these options in here good. I want to use a reverse connection and I also want to show advanced options. So scrolling down in here, uh, just to make sure everything is set up correctly. And it looks like everything in here is good. It doesn't give us a domain option to change that or a workstation option to change that. In reading the description, it says the module exploits the RPC service impersonation vulnerability detailed in Microsoft Bulletin MS, uh, MS 10 061 by making specific uh, DCE RPC requests to the start doc printer. So, spool SS, it's against the printer uh, service. So, um, it doesn't really tell us what, uh, what versions of Windows are actually exploitable to this. So, let's just go ahead and launch this and see if it'll actually work. And you can see it's setting all of its options, which you would be doing in. Uh, you know, MSF console, which is pretty easy because you can set globals in there, so it makes things a little bit easier, easier for you. So it says exploit failed, no access. The server responded with this error, status access denied. Okay, so guess what? It wasn't vulnerable to that. Well, we can check other vulnerabilities if we want on here, but again, this is why it's important to have your, um, you know, PDF export or whatever export you did from OpenVOS to see if it did in fact find any vulnerabilities on that machine. So this way you're not wasting an exorbitant amount of time trying each one of these individually or trying to do the check option, which some of them may fail, so you have to inherently do that uh, manually and fire each one. So you can see that there's an Oracle one, there's a Samba one. Uh, let's try the Oracle and just do check against it so we're not actually firing it. it says this target is not exploitable. Okay, so we know that, that uh, that's out. Uh, Sambo, let's go ahead and, even though Sambo is probably not going to work for this, let's go ahead and check exploits on that. Well, it says it doesn't support check, so we got to manually go back and do that uh, and actually fire this. So reading in here, you can sometimes determine whether or not it's worth your time to actually fire this exploit over at it. Is it, is it worth the, the fact of maybe being caught? Um, Module exploits a command execution vulnerability in the Samba versions 3.0.20 through 3.0.25 RC3 when using a non-default user name map script. Okay, so it doesn't really tell us that uh, what it's going against. So we can really just go ahead and click um, show advanced options. Just make sure if there's anything that we might change that might change our, our um, change our ability to actually exploit this. And we could probably try to change the domain if you wanted to. Um, we'll just name this Acme Inc. Local, which is what that domain controller, or which that is part of the domain. Um, if you had usernames and passwords, you could try to put them in over here. We don't have any usernames and passwords yet, so let's just go ahead and click launch. And you see exploit failed. Um, there's no, it's not a vulnerable to that exploit. All right, so we basically tried almost all of them, guys. Um, again, using PS Exec, 
would uh, use a pass to hash attack so you'd have to dump the hashes from the server or another compromised machine and try to pass those along the domain to the other workstations or servers in the domain. Now generally speaking when a Windows domain controller is on a network and everybody's connecting to that it uses um, LDAP and the back end of Active Directory to uh, store usernames and passwords so you can authenticate to the actual domain controller and say hey yeah I'm part of the domain give me an IP address give me DNS give me shared folders give me you know actor uh, directory access to certain things give me printers give me all that good stuff right so when you're using pass to hash you're basically dumping all those hashes that were in the uh, domain controller and trying to pass it along to the workstations in hopes that the administrator which they normally do uh, adds themselves to each machine so they can remote and fix things whatever or give the other uh, local user different privileges so on and so forth so you want to try to pass the hash across that and it should show up as a compromised machine and you do have the option to set a payload like a reverse TCP interpreter shell and that machine would in turn be compromised again we'll get into all this in post exploitation but I just want to touch on it so you guys know what you're looking at so uh, obviously again we could see this dialog box here doesn't have a close option or any kind of minimize option so again right click on it and just go to close so it looks like we're not getting access to this target just yet however if we use the pass to hash attack there is a chance that we can still get in now this is um, basically just a, a remote attack uh, if we did a client side attack where we, we couldn't get in remotely any other way like there was no other services that were vulnerable uh, we might use a client side attack and a client side attack is using something like a social engineering toolkit tricking a user to download a payload um, or basically an exploit uh, and a payload from us uh, so that uses a little bit of social engineering as well let's move on to our Windows 7 host uh, again if you go to, under the attack menu uh, you can see here that it says MS-03026 DCOM. Well, let's go ahead and click on that and let's read the description. Now, this is where it's going to come in handy. Okay, so it gives us some um, operating systems that are vulnerable to this. It says this module can be exploit the English version of Windows NT 4.0, Service Pack 3-6A, Windows 2000, Windows XP, and Windows 2003 all in one request. Well, we know this is a Windows 7 machine. We're not really working with uh, you know any of that stuff right and if you go down to your targets option that's the only options that are selected so we're not even gonna bother firing that one because guess what it's probably not gonna work so right click again again go to attack so the DCE RPC is out Oracle ah, let's not worry about that one here Samba um, this one here so now it has an MS 08067 but here's the thing guys if you went to here and you went to hosts since that's the only one that's selected and uh, I'm sorry attacks and find attacks it's gonna go ahead and query exploits for that as well so just to do that just to make sure that we're not missing anything here and it doesn't look like we're missing anything okay so again MS 08067 if we click on that we know that that's only working for Windows uh, XP and Windows 2003 so let's close that and it doesn't look like we really have any other thing on the way in. Now, you can always double check what exploits are available for Windows 7 by searching online or something like that. But again, reference to your OpenVOS PDF. So opening up Armitage again, the other thing we could try to do on here besides a client side attack is again a, a pass to hash attack to see if we can log into this machine and compromise it. Once we do that, if we opened up a interpreter shell, guess what? We have access on that system, right? So we could take screenshots, we could do key logs, we can, you know, escalate privileges, we can, there's a whole myriad of stuff we'll get to in post exploitation. But uh, that just gives you a brief overview of how Armitage actually works, compromising one host. Now, using the same knowledge, we're going to try to compromise uh, hosts inside of MSF Console. All right, guys, so that pretty much takes care of Armitage. We're going to get into MSF Console quickly. Um, the first thing you need to know is you always need to go to the Applications menu, Kali Linux, and then System Services, and start uh, Metasploit Community Pro uh, Services. Uh, since we've already used Armitage and this is the same video, those services are already started for us. So simply to start uh, MSF console, just in a command line uh, or in a terminal, type in MSF console and hit enter. And it may take about a minute or so to uh, actually load it up. Uh, the other thing worth noting is every time you use Metasploit, you should probably do an update, MSF update. You don't have to be in uh, Metasploit console to do that. Uh, the MSF console, you don't have to be in there to do that. You can actually just issue that from a command line and it'll do it for you. 
So when you start it up, uh, you'll see here that it'll tell you the version here on the bottom and uh, how many exploits, auxiliary modules, post modules, payloads, encoders, and NOPs are in the database. Okay, so I haven't updated mine in a while because this is just the uh, lab box here. So, And since we're working with older Windows machines, I know it's going to be just fine. So let me just clear this out here. Okay, so there's a couple of things that you should know right off the bat. Okay, first things first is um, you have to do... If you wanted to use like the uh, import function that we use in Armitage, um, there's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, we want to import our Nmap scan results. So when you're in your MSF console, if you ever need help, just type in the help command and it's going to give you a list of options that you can use at the core to uh, do things that you need to do. So uh, you can notice that a couple things we're going to go over here is set and set G. Set is used to set uh, parameters or options inside of a payload or an exploit, a scanner, so on and so forth. Set G is to set global parameters. So if we're working with just one specific uh, target IP address or range, we can set that as a global parameter. Uh, show always displays modules of a given type or all modules, and we're going to get into that as well. Uh, also, you have a couple of things down here with uh, DB export uh, to export it like a report type of deal, which, as I discussed, is kind of cumbersome because it's there's no X, uh, XSL file for it to be converted to an HTML document. So that's something I'm working on writing, like I said. Uh, DB nmap is the built-in nmap scanning module for that. Uh, and then you have DB import, which imports uh, your scan results file from any other scanners, specifically nmap. So... Um, in order to do the import, we have to first check to make sure that there's nothing in our database. If you notice in Armitage, first thing we did was clear our database out because we don't want to get that confused with something else that we might have been scanning before, uh, so on and so forth. So in order to do that, uh, you just have to type in hosts and hit enter. Now, as you can see here, I already have some stuff in here from uh, doing some demonstrations a little while ago. Um, if you have stuff in there you want to clear, it's just hosts. Tac D for delete. You can delete in individual hosts uh, by just typing in its IP address. So if, for instance, we just want to uh, delete the 1.21, one, we just type in 192.168.1.2 and hit enter. And it says it deleted one host down here at the bottom, and it tells you the host it deleted. And then if you issued the host command again, we would see we only have it here too. Now, I want to delete the whole database because I want to start fresh, right? So it's host Tac D for delete all. And it deletes two hosts, the two hosts that were left over. Uh, again, if we type in host, we can make sure that uh, our database is actually clear. Okay, so let me clear the screen out here. So we talked about uh, learning how to use set G. Now, set G sets global parameters for you to use. So if you're working against one specific target IP, or if you're doing an internal audit and you're working towards an entire subnet range or you know something like that, you can always use the set G parameter. We'll get to that here in just a minute. First we want to do is the DB import because we want to import our um, Nmap scan that we did before, right? So it's DB underscore import and the path to where the file actually resides. So that's root and then that's Acme Inc. And then that was uh, fresh scan dot, uh, dot XML. So just hit enter after that and you can see that it's importing all of our hosts for us here. Now again, we're going to have to go through and remove some of these hosts. So to save a little bit of time because I know a couple of them are, you know, like 1.1 is the router again and 1.3 is this machine that we're working off of here. Okay. So let's clear this out. Now let's go ahead and uh, issue the host command again. And you can see now that it's imported all of our hosts. However, as I said, um, it's not reading correctly on the operating system. And as before, we know 1.9 is actually a Windows 2003 box. So it didn't really import it correctly in terms of the OS name or any kind of service packs or things like that. All right, so first things first, I want to remove the host that we're not going to scan. So I'm just going to host hd 192.168.1.1. And I'm going to do the same thing for dot .3. And then I'm just going to issue the host command again. All right, so now we have our three target machines in here. So the thing is that you want to do what we did in Armitage and use the MSF scan to better enumerate the operating systems and the service packs available to them. 
So those are actually located in a directory structure, and I'm going to put a link in the description to learn everything there is to learn about MSF Console, so you guys have a, a, a guide or a reference to go to if you get a little confused. Okay, so um, auxiliary uh, holds, as we've seen in Armitage, the directory tree structure, auxiliary holds some of your scanners, fuzzers, um, you know, DDoS attackers, uh, you know, brute forcers, things like that. Uh, scanners that we want to use in terms of what the MSF scan was all about is actually called SMB underscore version because we want to find out what version these operating systems are actually, the, the, the true versions of the operating systems are. So anytime that you want to find an actual uh, scanner, exploit, vulnerability, payload, whatever that you're looking for and you know the name of it, you can use the locate command. So that's locate and then I'm looking for specifically SMB version. And now you can see it tells me that it's in auxiliary, scanner, SMB, SMB version. That's the scanner that I want to use. But what if I didn't know the name of the actual scanner that I was looking to use, right? So I could do show auxiliary, and it's going to show me everything in the auxiliary uh, directory tree structure. And it may take a minute or, or maybe a little less, depending on how fast your system is, because it is literally querying and doing like a directory command on everything that uh, is in the auxiliary folder. Now you can see here, it, it scrolls back everything that's under auxiliary, okay? So we want to look for SMB because we know that uh, we're looking to do some Windows stuff. And if we look here, we only have a few options for SMB scanners starting at the very top here. SMB pipe auditor, things like that. Well, SMB PSE exec, okay, SMB2, and we are looking for SMB version. So right here, it's under auxiliary as the top directory, then it's in scanner, SMB, SMB version. Okay, so let's just clear out the screen here. All right, so first we want to use that actual tool. So the command is simple, use auxiliary scanner, oops, SMB and then SMB underscore version. Okay, and you can always use tab as autocomplete. You can also arrow up, arrow down if you want to, you know, go through your commands that you've already issued and just do it again. So I'm going to hit enter. Now you can see that the screen has changed a little bit here and the SMB version is now highlighted in red. So that's actually what we're actually in right now. So we want to know what options are available to us in this, this script that we're using. So simply type in show options and it'll tell you all the options. Now our hosts, uh, SMB domain, workgroup, SMB pass, user thread, so on and so forth. We can change all that. We want to type in our hosts. Now we're going to type in a range, right? So we want to go from dot two to dot nine. So it's simply to set an option, it's set and then the option, our hosts. And you can use autocomplete on that just to make sure you're getting in the right syntax. Okay, and then it's 192.168.1.2 through dot nine. Now you don't have to type in a dot before nine. Keep that in mind. And hit enter. Now if you did show options again, you should see that it reflected. And here it is. Okay, so our changes have been made. And now simply we want to run the scanner. So what's the command? Run. Very simple, right? Now you can see it's going through and it's going to do a determination on the operating system and the service pack available to it. Now it's not always 110% accurate, but it's pretty damn close most of the time. And you can see it's going to take a little while, depending on the IP address range you're scanning, you know, your internet speed, your computer speed, all those things again guys factor into any of the scans that we ever do. So keep that in mind uh, if things are going a little bit slow. Okay, so it said scanned 8 out of 8 hosts, 100% complete, auxiliary module execution completed. Fantastic. So now if we issue the host command again, ah, now we have a little bit more accurate depiction of what our machines actually look like. So now 1.9, instead of reporting as it was Windows XP, guess what? It's Windows uh, Server 2003, Service Pack 0, right? So um, I know 1.3 is my box here, so again, I just want to remove that with host-d and then 192.168.1.3 okay clear this screen again type in hosts okay so now we know what we're working with here right so 
let's get back to our set G command because now we know that we're up against a Windows 2003 server and we want to target that first and foremost because hey that's the meat and potatoes of everything right if you get access on that system uh, depending on what type of access or level of access we get we can pretty much own the rest of the network right so that's going to be our target machine we want to go after first all right so now if you if you think that you know um, a target network has high level security you probably want to go a little bit lower level you want to start with a workstation and try to work your way up to getting to the server okay but since this is our lab network I know I just want to go after the Windows domain controller first and then try to own everything else after that so anytime you want to get out of whatever module or scanner or whatever you're using just type in back and that'll get you out of it well, let's clear this out again and let's go ahead and issue our host command so we know what we're up against alright so getting back to set G um, the command to set those is simply set G and then uh, if you just hit enter it's going to show you that there's no global entries in there right now so we want to do set G um, our hosts and we want to set that to 192.168 dot one dot nine because that's the machine that we're after right and if we do set G again by itself we can see that the R host is now set to 192.168.1.9 beautiful thing so clear this out again now we know already that uh, MS080 uh, that Windows 2003 server is actually vulnerable to that now if you weren't sure where an exploit actually lives or a payload actually lives you can always do that locate command again so if we did locate ms08 underscore 067 you can see that it's in exploits windows smb ms08 067 so whenever we want to use something a command is always going to be use and when you want to do a payload you're going to set the payload to use when that exploit actually happens so keep that in mind it's used to use a scanner payload uh, I'm sorry used to use a scanner an exploit so on and so forth set to set the payload that's going to be working with that exploit so we want to set up our exploit first so we use use exploits exploit windows SMB following our uh, path up here from our locate command MS 08067 at API hit enter okay so now you can see that you're you're in this actual exploit so again show options okay well now you could see that our R host is already filled in for us, right? Because it's a set G command, the global parameter that we put in. We don't want to change our port, but you can if you want to. And how you would do that is just simply set. To set an option, you just type in set, not set G. And then you do R port, whatever it is. And then I'm just going to leave this the same, but just to show you how it works, 445. And now, of course, if you did show options again, you can see that it's taken it it's in there already but generally speaking you leave the R port alone because that's what the uh, exploit is actually set up to work off of so you don't really want to change that unless of course you know your client has changed that service to a different port then of course you're gonna to wanna to have to do that um, so anyway now we have our exploit set up that's the exploit we're gonna use so now we need to pick our payload I love Windows interpreter shells. I mean, they're just awesome, and they give you so much power and control over the system once you've compromised it. That uh, that's all I seem to tend to stick to. Now, uh, there is a interpreter version for Linux. If you want to learn more about interpreter, you can go on uh, a couple of different websites. I'll put one in the uh, description as well. Uh, if you want to go on that, or of course, you can always go to learnnetsec.com and uh, check out our forums. Ask us about it over there. Okay, so um, now we want to use or I'm sorry we want to set the payload that we're going to use so I want to locate my interpreter oops payloads and you can see it scrolls past a bunch guys right so there's going to be scripts interpreter 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 then of course you're going to go up here and there's going to be modules payloads stages there's a bunch of stuff in here so you may want to take some time getting familiar with the directory structure and where it's actually at um, you know what what you want to use but we want to use something for Windows so we're gonna look um, through this whole line of stuff here for something that would go into Windows well pro version that's only for the pro uh, so here we can go data interpreter you know so on and so forth but I happen to know where that is already from you know just remembering it uh, pretty much so I'm gonna get out of here and I'm just gonna clear the screen 
So I want to set payload, okay? And then you, so you're telling it to set the payload that you want to use, and then it's in Windows. Sometimes it takes a minute if you're doing autocomplete. Um, so it's Windows Meterpreter, and then it's reverse TCP I want to use. Now there's a bunch of different options. You can use reverse TCP, reverse, um, or bind TCP. You can use reverse DNS, so on and so forth. I like reverse TCP as my default because it seems to work the best for me anyway. Okay, so once I do that, I hit set, and now it, it's um, set the Windows payload for that. Okay, so um, once you do that and you do show options again, uh, you're going to go ahead and find where the payload options are. So you want to set L host for your local host to your IP address of your Kelly Linux machine. In this case, it's 1.99. Now keep in mind for L port, if you're using the default port 4444, if you're behind a NAT device like a router or something like that, uh, you want to do the port forwarding, of course, if you're doing something over the WAN. Um, of course, if you're local, then you don't have to worry about that. Um, or you could put your Kelly Linux machine up on the DMZ and not have to worry about any of that. So I'm going to set my L host to 1.99. Now, if I do show options again, you can see that everything is set for me. So I've set my exploit. And I've set the R host, which was set by uh, set G, the global parameters. And now in payload options, I did my reverse TCP. Now again, you can use set G to set your L host as well if you wanted to. So a simple set G L host 192.168.1.99 or, or uh, attacking machine. Okay, and then of course set G, you can now see that it's both set. Okay, in any case, now we're ready to fire our script, but do we really want to fire it yet, or do we want to check to make sure that that host is actually vulnerable? So simply, if you want to check, just type in check and hit enter. And here we go. It says the target is vulnerable. Now, this is much the same as you see the output in um, Armitage in the console windows. So I know this target's vulnerable. I want to go ahead and fire it. So I just simply type in exploit, tack J to background it and go ahead and hit enter. Once you see, as I said, sending stage, you know that you're almost guaranteed to be in. Next line you see is interpreter session one opened on our local computer here on port 4444, and then it's to the target machine on port 1739. Now you might be saying to yourself, well, oh great, but it looks like the screen is frozen. It's not. Just hit enter, and that's gonna drop you back to your command line. Now, it says that it opened a session, but how do we find out what sessions that we have open? Simply type in the sessions command and hit enter, and you can see that the session ID 1 is interpreter, and it is running as system at, one nine, uh, at the um, target IP address of 1.9. Okay, well now, great, we know we have a session open, but how do we interact with that? How do we get into the interpreter shell? Very simple. There's no right-click menus here like there was in Armitage. So it's sessions, tack I, oops, tack I for interact, and then the session ID, which is one in our case. Okay, so now we're dropped into a interpreter shell. Well, that's all well and good, but how do we know what to do here? There's no right-click menu. Well, simple. Type in help. That'll give you a list of all the commands that you can actually do and their top-level meaning, like privilege, uh, elevate, um, commands get system. Uh, well, we know we're already system, so we don't have to worry about that. You got hash dump to dump the password hashes. Uh, you've got timestamp to manipulate the mace attributes. Um, you have a bunch of different stuff in here, like uh, get desktop. Um, you could do uh, start a keylogger uh, in there. Uh, you could do screenshots. Um, you know, like for instance, if I want to do a screenshot right now, I just type in screenshot, hit enter, and it tells you. The screenshot was saved to root, E-D-I-G-W, whatever. It makes up some random name. So now if we went into our computer, and we went into file system, and then we went into root, well, we can see that there's a JPEG here. So open with image viewer. It may just take a second here. My system's lagging a little bit. 
Okay, well, there's the screenshot that I just took. So it's it's an, on its idle screen, so we know nobody's sitting in front of it right now, right? So that's pretty awesome. Um, and then again, I mean, you know, you have a bunch of different commands here. You can record their microphone, their webcam. I mean, you can list webcams if there was one attached. I don't have one attached to that because it's a virtual machine, but um, you could drop into a system shell. Uh, you can modify the remote registry. Uh, you can reboot the computer. Uh, you could kill a process. You can list the processes here with PS. Um, you can get privs, get PID. Um, so if we want to do get PID, looks like current PID is 920. If we did PS to list all the processes, uh, you would look for 920 in there for process ID. And here we are right here. Um, so we are under the SVC host.exe and that's where we're at. Okay, so um, again, issuing the help command, just to go through some more of the other parameters here, uh, you can do an upload, upload a file a directory. You can remove directory. Um, you know, you can do basically, uh, you can cat some directories of a, of a file, uh, stuff like that. So, I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff you can do here, migrate processes, pretty much everything you can do and a little bit more uh, from Armitage, the way with the right-click menu and all that good stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a ton of stuff you can do in here, guys. But uh, that's pretty much it for uh, using Meterpreter. Um, if you want to get out of Meterpreter and kill your session at the very same time, you can always do exit, right? So those sessions uh, are closed and if we type in sessions again you can see that there's no active sessions so let me just get out of here I want to go ahead and just do this quickly so you guys see how fast once you get used to it see how fast it actually works so again I want to list my hosts I want to go after 1.9 I've done my set G parameters already so I know that that's good I want to uh, use exploit Windows SMB MS08067. I want to show options. And it looks like my options were set in there. And of course, I want to um, use my uh, interpreter shell. So it's set payload windows interpreter reverse TCP show options my L host is already set because I did a set G now I just want to do check vulnerable I want to do exploit J there you go my sessions opened now let's say if you list your sessions and you just like, all right, good, I got a shell on that box. Really need to do anything else. You can always do your kill command in session. So it's sessions, tac k, and then the session ID, which is in our case two. Sessions closed. Sessions again, no active sessions. We're all done. And we can back out of here and clear. And we can exit MSF console and we are back to normal, right? So that's pretty much it, guys, for uh, using um, MSF Console in place of Armitage. Now, Armitage might be easier for some beginners because it is GUI-based. It's kind of point-and-click and kill, uh, whereas some of our seasoned veteran guys uh, might be more comfortable with MSF Console. And like I said, I've noticed a few bugs inside of Armitage that, uh, you know, like with PSE exec and pass the hash, uh, which didn't show as a compromised host. Meanwhile, I did the same thing in MSF console the same exact way, and sure enough, it gave me a reverse uh, interpreter shell on that box. So, meanwhile, while there wasn't any other active exploits as we've seen for, like, the Windows XP Service Pack 3 box in Armitage or the Windows 7, uh, 7 box in Armitage, I was able to actually use pass the hash and PSE uh, PS exec and actually compromise those machines and open interpreter sessions on those as well. So that's pretty much it, guys. Um, make sure to uh, give us a thumbs up on the video if you like it, you've learned something. Uh, make sure to subscribe to our channel here. Uh, also, make sure to check out uh, our website, learnnetsec.com. Uh, join the forums and uh, 
hang out with us, chat with us, ask questions. Uh, we're there to help and learn from each other. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Check us out on Facebook. Uh, all the links are in the description for everything we discussed here today. And uh, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Take care.